Hello and welcome. We are now ready to begin today's webinar, How to Apply Risk to Your Quality Management System, featuring Morgan Palmer, Chief Technology Offer, Officer, ETQ, Inc. My name is Patty Murray, and I will be your host and moderator for this webinar, which is being sponsored by ETQ and brought to you by Medical Device Summit. ETQ's management software system helps device manufacturers meet the challenge of maintaining quality and FDA compliance management systems that can adapt to the changing market needs, provide tools to shorten product development life cycles, manage the supply chain, and are compliant with a wide range of regulatory requirements. We have formally allotted 60 minutes for today's program, and you can send your questions to me and our speaker throughout the event using the Q&A feature. We will get to as many of your questions as possible during a special Q&A session at the end. The webinar is being recorded, and an archived version will be available for your review in a few days, along with a copy of the slides. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Morgan Palmer has over 20 years' experience delivering software solutions. Morgan joined ETQ to create the company's first software application and is now responsible for Reliance, ETQ's flagship product for quality, environmental, and safety management. As ETQ's Chief Technology Officer, Morgan continues to drive the innovation and strategy that make ETQ the leading provider in the markets it serves. Morgan? Thank you, Patty, and uh, thank you everyone for joining me today for this presentation. Uh, what we'll be covering today is um, a look at how we measure compliance um, in today's business, which is becoming more and more complex, and how we can use the risk management process and risk, manage, risk assessment tools to drive new ways of looking at compliance. I'll be doing a presentation on the risk management process as it's uh, described in the standards and looking at uh, risk assessment models that you can deploy in your quality or um, environmental health and safety systems in order to measure and improve compliance. Um, so having said that, I'd just like to say a few words about ETQ. Uh, so ETQ is the leading quality and compliance management solution designed for identifying, mitigating, and preventing high-risk events through automation, integration, and collaboration. The key term here is high-risk events. Uh, although we are a compliance management software, everything we do is about risk, and you'll see that through this presentation. Uh, the company itself was founded in 92, and our founders have a, a long background in quality and environmental compliance. Our unique differentiator is the concept of a flexible workflow engine, uh, recognizing that everyone's systems, processes are unique. Although we're all trying to achieve um, compliance with similar standards, it's how you do that is, is different for each organization and becomes actually a competitive differentiator. We operate in many different markets, uh, quality EHS um, being the main ones. Uh, we provide configurable workflow-based business process automation tools with out-of-the-box best practices, but the tool, the platform, is very flexible and allows you to automate pretty much any process uh, around compliance management. The tool also features uh, enterprise reporting capabilities that are built in and um, features risk management as part of the core processes. So that's about ETQ. Uh, let's talk about your organizations. So your organizations are faced with an ever-increasing rate of change. Your you're dealing with complex organizations to start with. Um, you have design and production facilities spread out around the world. You're dealing with uh, mergers and acquisitions, which change the internal processes within your organizations. You have to deal with deeper and deeper supply chains that are making more and more of your products or delivering more and more of your services. You're also dealing with intensifying competition. Uh, that competition is driving shorter product life cycles it's forcing you to adopt new technologies at a faster pace, uh, further increasing the complexity. It's driving you to um, adapt your products to local, um, local preferences, to meet local needs. And in fact, with the, the big data that everyone's talking about, um, your sales and marketing groups are asking you to meet the, the needs of individual customers now, um, maybe even one day individual consumers. So this is all making for a very complex environment, and in that environment, your job is to maintain compliance. And so how do you do that? 
and keep up with the pace of business. So ways in which you've done that is uh, through automation. Uh, with companies like ETQ and ETQ's products, you can automate many of your compliance processes, and that helps. You can also integrate with your existing business systems, and that's important because much of the data that you need for compliance is actually coming from other systems. So integration is a key way of speeding up and making compliance management more effective and more efficient. And through automation and with integration, you can drive towards harmonizing your compliance processes. There should be a best way of doing things within your organization, and you should be rolling that out to all your areas. Despite that, despite those ways of dealing with the increased complexity, cost of compliance is skyrocketing in pretty much all your organizations that we talk to. The cost of the systems is increasing. The amount of time and people involved in maintaining compliance is increasing. The cost of holding back operations increasing. By, by that, I mean the added compliance uh, effort is slowing down your production and uh, manufacturing processes. And you're also being forced to build up uh, inventory as a result of that, which is inventory which is linked in or tied into the compliance management processes. And we refer to that as a hidden factory of work, of people, of time, of cost of inventory tied up in the, in the quality management process. And that, those costs are significant, and they're increasing. So one of the, um, the trends that we're seeing is looking at compliance a little bit differently. And instead of saying, well, we have to be 100% compliance compliant, it's, which is really a black and white argument, which is usually um, enforced or monitored through audits, are you compliant or not compliant, um, organizations are starting to take a look at a way of understanding if they're compliant enough. So define an ex and define an, uh, defining an acceptable level of compliance. And the risk management tools and the risk assessment methodologies are a way that they can do that, and with the result that they can actually provide a, a more efficient measure of compliance than they have right now, so that they can allocate their resources more effectively and start to drive down the cost of compliance. So that's what the presentation will be talking about. How do you use risk management and the risk assessment tools to better manage your level of compliance, to better direct your investment in compliance? The compliance standards themselves are catching on. So depending on your specialty or, or area of business, uh, some of these standards will be uh, familiar to you. Uh, it's a broad range, doesn't just cover medical device. The point is, is that uh, these standards, these quality and safety standards, have a lot of similarity, and all of them are referring to risk nowadays. There is, of course, the um, overall risk management standard, ISO 31000, which you can't actually be certified against. It's just a, a guideline, um, but it's guidance that you find uh, peppered through all the other standards as well. So we'll be, I'll be coming back to the ISO 31000 standard in, in just a bit. Um, but it's important to note that when you're trying to achieve compliance with your existing standards, your quality or safety standards, uh, they will, to varying levels of, um, of, of de to varying degrees, they will refer to risk and in some cases make risk the center point for how to achieve compliance. So going back to 31000, 31,000 describes the risk management process. So I do want to make a difference between risk management and risk assessment. Um, risk assessment is just one piece of the risk management process. The 31,000 basically um, provides a roadmap uh, describing the process of risk management. It's important to note that risk management is a process. It's not just an event. So the phases of this process are risk identification, which a lot of you do to some degree if you're involved in medical device, uh, when you come to, for example, identifying all the hazards associated with the product, your hazard analysis process. Um, but the risks go beyond that. Uh, there could be organizational risks, there could be occupational injury risks. There are risks everywhere within the organizations. Now, I'm not extending this to things like financial risk or commercial risk, uh, although risk does apply in those areas as well. For this presentation, we're really talking about operational risk. 
So the first step is to identify all your risks. The second step is to quantify that risk. And there are ways of doing that, and we'll talk about the different ways of doing that, but there are risk assessment models that can help you do that. The important part of quantifying the risk is to implement a process that uses objective and proven tools, which is the third phase. So you want to develop um, ex uh, proven and objective ways of measuring this risk. The key value of uh, risk assessment is to make something that is right now subjective, somebody's gut feel, more objective. And so a consistent way of doing the measurement is critical for that. Then the fourth phase is to make decisions. So once you have evaluated the risk, assessed the risk, uh, you need to know what to do with that. It's not sufficient just to collect the data. There are many different decisions you can make with risk, which is what makes risk assessment actually very interesting. It's not just about being um, in compliance or not in compliance, as it would be, for example, with an audit finding. Um, there are many different things you can do depending on the level of risk and um, the level of risk that your organization is currently facing in these different areas. So some of the decisions you could make, for example, would be to accept the level of risk. It's an acceptable level of risk. That is a perfectly acceptable decision. You could choose to reduce it by mitigating the risk. You could choose to compensate by seeking insurance, uh, which it doesn't have to be this traditional insurance. There could be many different ways of insuring against risk. You could choose to transfer that risk to your supply chain. Now, of course, at that point, you have to bring in uh, monitoring processes to make sure that they themselves are mitigating the risk or taking the appropriate steps. And you could also choose to avoid the risk completely by stopping what you're currently doing, again, in that specific step of the process. Then the fifth phase is to actually implement the solution. So risk management doesn't stop at making the decision. It actually talks about change management. And change management is a very large topic that deserves its own presentation, but it is part of the risk management process as well. I would like to just say a few words on the risk management terminology, uh, which we have been using and I'll be using um, in the following slides. Uh, so the way I'm referring to this, these terms, a hazard is a situation that poses a level of threat to life, health, or property, or environment. Um, it's also called or considered to be an undesired event. Uh, in this illustration, the hazard is the anvil that is hanging um, that could potentially fall on somebody. That's the hazard. Uh, the risk is that potential, the potential that a chosen action or activity will lead to an undesirable event. So here the risk is that somebody trips the trip wire, which makes the anvil fall. Um, and finally, the control, which is the method of evaluating potential losses and taking action to reduce or eliminating the potential of an undesired event. So it's the taking action which is important. Uh, we also consider controls to be barriers, uh, and I'll come back to that uh, later in the presentation. In this case, um, we have several controls. We have a, a gangplank that goes over the tripwire. We have some flags that indicate that there's a hazard. And usually, and it's quite usual, you'll have many more controls and you'll have risks. There are many ways of mitigating that risk or preventing that risk. Another, word, another um, slide just on the concept of risk management, uh, just to say that risk management doesn't just apply to quality or just to safety or just to environmental, which are the key operational contexts that we've been talking about. It also applies to financial, regulatory, and commercial. And the point of this slide is that it's a language that is common to all these areas. It's also a language that senior management understands because they're dealing with all these areas. Uh, often when we're talking about compliance, we're, we end up talking about why things didn't work or why a product's unsafe in language that a senior manager may not understand or they have an understanding of it, but they don't have a full knowledge of it. So um, being able to express compliance in the language of risk also makes communicating compliance easier. Before we get started on evaluating the different risk assessment models, I would like to take a, say a few words on why risk management is hard. Uh, as I said already, the standards, the quality management standards are all saying that we should be doing risk management and risk assessment. Um, in reality, few organizations are doing it well or doing it pervasively, and that's because it's, it's actually quite difficult. Um, but the risk management tools, the risk management process and the risk assessment tools make it possible 
and um, actually um, make something that would be impossible uh, something that you can do in a consistent and objective way. Because without it, we're basically left to the human judgment, and human judgment is not at all well suited to assessing risk. And so this slide kind of gets to that. Um, there's a lot of focus on the risk management process and the risk assessment tools. And this presentation is no different. We're going to be focusing on the process and the tools. Um, however, the key to making risk management work is actually the content that you put into the process and the tools. And by that I mean, what are the hazards that you're actually evaluating? What is your hazard library? How exhaustive, exhaustive is this? How representative is it? That's the first level of content. Because if you're not measuring the right hazard, obviously you're not getting the right results. The other thing is, is how well have you calibrated your risk levels? Is an acceptable level of risk truly acceptable in, in your context? Um, how well have you tested those levels against reality? And that's obviously a constant effort that needs to be done and is usually not something you can do across the organization. It has to be done in each different um, operational uh, function. I will get back to this at the end of the presentation as well, but just keep that in mind that although you might understand the process and you might have great tools, in the end it's the content that uh, is going to make the difference between a good risk management process and a, and a not so good one. We also need to understand the limitations of risk management and risk assessment and why is it that it's such a difficult process. Um, as I was saying, humans are not good at assessing risk. We don't expect the unexpected by definition. We reconstruct instead of replaying, which means we are not very good at replaying a past event exactly as it happened. We inject our own ideas, concepts, preconceptions, and things that have happened since then in order to reconstruct something that, in fact, may be very different than what happened. So we're not very good at, us at comparing two different events that may be the same or may be different. We often see patterns in random events. Uh, something happens twice this week, I'm going to think it's more important than something that happened only once this week and once three weeks ago, even though over a longer period of time, they exhibit the same randomness. We confuse understanding with knowledge. Just because we think we understand something, we actually believe that that understanding gives us the ability to make deep decisions, uh, very intricate and detailed decisions about that area, where really you need experts in order to do that. Um, so we, we as, certainly as decision makers and managers, we're often confusing understanding with the knowledge sufficient to make the right decision. And then as we work together, and risk management is really a, a process where a lot of people work together as teams and close-knit teams, we're subject to groupthink. We all start thinking alike, alike which, is, which is a problem. In addition to those human failings, uh, we all know that prediction is hard. Uh, it's very difficult. Um, many studies have been done on this, and even the experts don't predict well. Um, in fact, the studies have shown that experts predict no better than non-experts. And finally, we're dealing with very, very small sample sets. In some cases, we've had a single occurrence of a hazard, and we're expected to make long-term decisions based on that. So there's very little statistical analysis that we can apply. Uh, we have to make decisions based on almost nothing. And in some cases, uh, events or hazards that have never even occurred. So because of that, it's very important to use proven risk models, and those are the risk assessment tools that I'll be talking about. Um, we could try and uh, apply our gut feel intuition to this, but you wouldn't get good results at all. Uh, the other thing that's important is to collect a lot of data, and by that I mean uh, in order to practice this process, in order to collect data so that we can actually provide a, uh, perform some trend analysis and some some statistical analysis, we need to try and collect more data than we can by just tracking uh, hazards. It's not enough to wait for a critical event to happen. We should be also tracking near misses, uh, things that could have happened in order to um, supplement our library of data. And, um, and also, an, another important point is to try and roll out these processes to as many areas of the business as possible. Don't limit it to just, for example, your complaints management function. Roll it out to 
inspections and receiving and so forth and so on, so that your organization, organizational awareness of risk management increases. So when we talk about risk assessment, uh, risk assessment, we're really talking about the core technology at the heart of risk management. Risk assessment is um, it's a way to evaluate risk in an operational context. That's critical. Um, many of the um, much of the analysis is done on data that comes out of the event. The event is very context sensitive. And if you're doing the risk assessment outside of that context, so separate from the process, you are missing out on a lot of the data that you'll need to make the right choices. So, I mean, to boil it down, I'll, I'll cover these, um, this, um, this concept of risk assessment a bit more in detail in, in, a, in a later slide, but if you're evaluating risk by measuring the severity and the, prob uh, the severity and the uh, probability, the concept of probability and severity are very context sensitive, and you would need to know all of the um, factors that led up to this hazard or to this risk in order to make the right decision. So, being able to measure risk in context is critical to a effective risk management process. And for that to happen, you have to basically integrate risk assessment and therefore the risk assessment tools, the risk model, into your processes, into your compliance management processes. You can't consider them to be two separate processes. They have to be part of the same process. Um, we have to use repeatable and objective methods. We've talked about that, and there are several tools available that uh, I will discuss. It has to be easy to understand for the uninitiated. Um, although you will need the advice of experts, because the experts will be needed to have the knowledge of the information, the knowledge of the event, um, the tools themselves will end up being used by people on the front end, by um, people on the shop floor, people uh, manning the phones. Um, you're going to want to have something that, again, can be embedded into your process. And for that to happen, it has to be intuitive and it has to be um, easy to use and understand. Your risk assessment tool should also drive short-term and long-term changes. Don't think of risk assessment as just a way of raising an alert, although it's very good for that and should be used for that. And not only just raising an alert, but also telling you what type of alert, who needs to be notified, at what level. Um, that's excellent. But also think about risk assessment data as a way of driving long-term change, seeing trends or identifying trends, and, um, and um, basically driving your corrective action and preventive action process. And finally, Although risk assessment models and tools are based on proven and objective ways of, uh, of measuring risk, um, and although they are intuitive and easy to understand, all of that can actually drive you to a false sense of security, where you're looking at the red, yellow, and green that is typical of a risk assessment matrix, seeing the very succinct guidance that it provides, and basically trusting it, and trusting it too much. Part of the risk management process is to constantly reevaluate your risk assessment tools and the content of that risk assessment tool, uh, as I was talking about before, to calibrate the information in it, the information it uses, in order, so that in, in order for that risk assessment tool to still reflect reality. So it's very easy for these risk management processes to become disconnected from reality um, if they're not recalibrated on a regular basis. One of the nice things about uh, risk when it comes to compliance management is there's a lot of opportunity for collecting risk data. You can do it in your, uh, your product and process design phases as part of the change management process, as part of your PPAP process, for those of you who use that, as part of your hazard analysis process, and as part of your job safety analysis process, which is really more for occupational injury. You can do it for uh, in your manufacturing delivery processes, your core, your core production processes, as part of your NC and planned deviations. You can do it as part of your incident and accident reporting. And you can apply it post-production, which many of you do already, for your complaints handling, for supplier performance rating, for internal audits, for sustainability reporting, and in your CAPA process, you can do it not only as a way to evaluate whether a CAPA is even needed, you can also do it to figure out if it actually was effective. Uh, you could do a risk assessment at the beginning, get a risk level, you could perform the CAPA, and you can apply a risk assessment at the end 
to figure out if you've actually mitigated the risk. That provides a very objective measure of uh, performance improvement. So now I'm going to take you through a few risk models that um, are part of the ETQ system but uh, can be really embedded into your compliance management processes in order to start applying what the standards say we should be doing, which is applying risk management to compliance. The very um, first one is probably the simplest one, um, or the most recognized at least, which is the risk matrix. So the risk matrix is a, is a very fast way of doing a risk assessment that an individual can do, although it's often done as a team as well, and that really depends on the complexity of the, of the events that you're uh, assessing. Um, it's easy to use, it's colorful, which is always nice, and the way it works is you define two dimensions. It could be more than two dimensions, but typically it's two dimensions, and uh, they're typically probability and severity, although those change, the, the terminology can change. Sometimes it's likelihood instead of probability, and sometimes it's impact, criticality instead of severity. Um, and it gives you a matrix that you can use to assess, to determine at what level of risk you are. So if you have an event that happens, you can use the risk matrix to define how, what level of risk that event is. The key things to a risk matrix, which apply to all the risk assessment tools that I'll be talking about, so it's a nice way of introducing risk assessment tools, is that it provides guidance for the input, which is, it provides guidance for the user to, to, to input data into the tool. In this case, for example, it's telling them um, how to rate their probability and how to rate severity. Uh, minor, negligible, marginal. This is just an example, and in a real case, you would have typically much more information about what ne minor means, or what negligible means, or what marginal means. Uh, this could be um, added instructions, it could be pop-up help, it could be training, um, but the tool itself needs to guide the user into making the right decision. So guidance on the inputs is a critical factor of any risk assessment tool. The other thing it does is it provides um, guidance on the output. So it's going to not just give you a number uh, or a color, it will also provide guidance. You don't see that in the example, but it'll tell you what to do with that, um, with that risk level. So for example, it might say that uh, yellow is an acceptable level of risk, nothing needs to happen. Or it might say that yellow is a, a level of risk where you need to provide an alert, a notification. Or it might say that yellow is a level of risk where you need to generate a kappa. These are types of things that a risk assessment matrix can, can generate. Um, you can define that. In fact, you must define that. And there is no such thing as a generic risk matrix. There's no such thing as a generic risk assessment tool. It's all dependent on your process, on your organization's um, ability to deal with risk or appetite for risk, if, if you will, um, and how you want to use the tool to guide your processes. Some examples that you're probably familiar with on how risk, risk matrices are used in the real world, and all these examples that I'll be showing you are taken from our, um, our, our users, our customer, our customer base. Um, so identifying potential adverse events is a, a classic case of using a risk matrix where um, the customer complaints are routed for investigation and the subject matters perform risk assessment, typically as a group, because they need to get experts from very, a variety of different fields. And the risk levels that they come up with drive decisions. And they drive decisions, very important decisions. They drive decisions for recalls, for example, or for notifying specific people or outside authorities, like the FDA, or for creating CAPAs. Risk assessments also heavily used in the health and safety field for uh, monitoring occupational injuries. Uh, so an example here is where a global facilities management company has rolled out a risk assessment tool so that their local facilities, and we're talking about um, a company that actually has over a thousand facilities around the world. They're fairly small offices, obviously, but each, each, each facility has a, um, an incident manager. And obviously they can't train every incident manager to the same level of expertise, so they have to provide them with a very easy to use, intuitive tool that they can use to uh, define, arrive at a level of risk themselves. That's where the risk tool really, really helps. It can provide
provide enough guidance and they've actually beefed up that level of guidance more than, uh, than we've seen with other organizations, where the relatively untrained, rel relatively unexpert person can use the risk tool to arrive at a, an, um, a fairly good risk level. Other, um, other examples, um, the services organization actually uses a risk matrix as a way of evaluating risk on a periodic basis. Instead of tracking it by event, they put out a survey, uh, they do it annually, uh, to all of their functional managers for them to, first of all, confirm all the known hazards uh, in their area and add new ones. And we're talking about organizational hazards or organizational risks. Use the risk matrix to assess the current level. And then when they get all this data back, they define a strategic plan to mitigate these risks. So it's a, a strategic tool. Risk Matrix uses a strategic tool on a periodic basis. And then um, finally, uh, in this, for, this, for these examples, uh, Risk Matrix used in, the, um, in order to identify potential hazards in people's jobs. So that's part of the occupational injury uh, space. And um, basically, you break down a job into the different steps and you evaluate the potential risk associated with each step. And based on that risk, you take the corrective actions. And I want to just, the reason this example is, is, um, is interesting is because it points out the fact that the risk will help you make decisions in a much more um, uh, informed way. So you're not just saying that this step in the job is dangerous or that this hazard is bad. You're saying, to what level is it dangerous? To what level is it bad? And then you can modulate uh, your investment, your response, based on that level of risk. So risk management just doesn't just identify what's good and bad. It also identifies the level of, of um, investment, uh, which ends up being real money, um, that you want to apply to mitigate that, that risk. So now we go from, from simple to very complicated. Uh, the FMEA, Failure Modes and Effects Analysis, is actually just a very complicated risk matrix. It has the same elements. In fact, if you look at the, the standard FMEA form, which is on the, on the screen, uh, you'll see the severity column and occurrence column, which is probability. It adds a third dimension, which is detectability. How easy is it to detect this? And um, the reason they do that is because they're often in an FMEA process, which is, I didn't say this, but it's used in typically in the design of products and processes where you're breaking down your product, your process into hundreds of subcomponents. So you could literally have hundreds of rows that you're evaluating and you're trying to understand where are the potential failures? Where are the possible risks associated with this product or process before I even put it into production? So that's very valuable because as we all know, identifying failures up front is much less costly than identifying them later or in the field. Uh, so it's a very useful and cost-effective um, um, process. Uh, it is fairly complex, and it does take time because they're looking at a lot of different um, components, or they call them systems and subsystems, of the product or of the process. Um, because they are evaluating so many different things and they're trying to understand where to invest their effort into mitigating the overall risk, they need to prioritize these risks. If they're only dealing with two dimensions, then you only get a certain amount of difference between the, the, the items. So for example, uh, something which is a high risk would maybe be something, maybe it'd be 100, and something that's a low risk is a one. If you add a third dimension, and each dimension is one to 10, you can actually go to 1,000. So now you have a range of 1,000 instead of 100. And that makes a big difference when you're dealing with hundreds of different items that you're trying to evaluate and prioritize in order to make investment decisions about mitigating the risk. So the FMA process is complicated. These are the steps involved. I'm not going to take you through it. That's its own presentation. It's very recommended in the design stages of your production process. Um, and out of it, you can make some informed decisions about um, how to mitigate the risk in the most cost-effective way possible. An example of where this is used is um, in the PPAP process. The PPAP process, for those of you who are not familiar with that, is a way of coordinating design changes with your suppliers. So you know you need to make a change to your product. You also know that your product is partially built by suppliers. 
and your suppliers are going to have to make design changes as well because of your design changes. The PPAP process coordinates the communication between the, um, the customer, which would be you, and the suppliers in order to make sure that those design changes are ad adopted uh, completely and that all of the impact of those changes is analyzed. And that's where the FMEA process comes in. The customer will expect an FMEA from the supplier that identifies all of the potential failures because of this, uh, these design changes, and they can then prioritize those potential failures, tell the, tell the supplier which ones need to be mitigated uh, at to what acceptable level, and then recognize the ones that are not mitigated. Recognize that these are potential failures that could then be have an impact on the product safety and could should therefore uh, be part of a, an information um, distribution or notification, possibly to the complaints group or to management or to regulatory. These are all things that could impact the product and the product's users in the future. So the FMEA is, is very complex. Decision trees are very easy. Um, many people don't recognize that decision trees are really a risk assessment model. Um, it has very similar criteria to a risk, um, very similar um, characteristics, sorry, to the risk matrix. It has guidance for the inputs, so it helps you uh, pick the right input. Those are the questions that it's asking you in the drill down as you go through the tree. And it provides you a guidance for the output, which is at the end of the tree, once you've answered all the questions, it'll tell you what to do in varying you know, levels of detail. So a, a decision tree is a risk assessment tool, and it's very beneficial because it's very intuitive. Everyone understands how to use it. So we often see that in, it's a very easy way of embedding risk in a simplistic way into any process. You might see it at the beginning of a CAPA. You might see it as, a, as a part of a change management process. Uh, you, you will see it, and you're very familiar with this already, as part of your notification to the FDA process uh, going through a decision tree. This is a way in which you're providing guidance to your users so that they can, uh, they can make the right decision. And the example that I have here is, is, that, is that very one. It's how do I know that I need to report to the FDA and in what timeline? Uh, now another process, the hazard analysis. And I'm not just talking about hazard analysis here as we tend to see it in the, um, in the medical device field, which is product safety. I'm talking about hazard analysis applied to your production process. Um, this is used in pharmaceutical, it's used in food and beverage, it's less used in medical device. Um, the short form is HACCP, and it stands for Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Points. The idea of the hazard analysis process is that you're using risk assessment at every stage of the process. So the first thing to do is to break down your process into different steps. And you then apply a risk assessment at each step to understand what are the potential hazards that I have and how risky are they? What's the level of risk for those hazards? Once you've done that, you can start applying risk mitigation factors to your process to drive down the level of risk where the risk level is unacceptable. Again, um, I mentioned this before, but it bears mentioning again, the risk assessment allows you to more finely tune your investment into compliance rather than just taking a um, scattergun approach where you're trying to fix every problem with investing by investing into controls everywhere, even where they're not needed. So with hazard analysis, it allows you to break down your process, apply risk assessment to each step of the process, identify the unacceptable levels of risk. You are then able to identify how you're going to mitigate the risk at that step in the process. And part of that might be to, de to define a critical control point. That's where the CCP comes in. The critical control point is a special um, process that you're going to put in place, which is going to have monitoring, so it's going to be actively monitored in order to make sure that you are reducing the level of risk to an acceptable level. Uh, so that's the process, and it's used, as I mentioned, mainly for uh, in food and beverage. And in this example, they're using it to, they've actually extended their process or the definition of their process to the supplier. So the supplier provides food stuff that's part of their production process, uh, ingredients, and they're capturing their delivery process or their shipment process and delivery process, that becomes the start of their process and all the steps that go on from there, and using the HACCP to identify how much inspection they need at each step. 
And where do I need special monitoring tools? Where do I have to make a, an extra investment because the level of risk at that step is unusually high? So that's a classic case of using the HACCP to, um, to identify the, 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 the most risky areas and to identify the level of effort needed to mitigate that risk. This is the last risk assessment tool that I'll be talking about. It's the bow tie model. It's not used heavily in uh, the medical device field or even in the pharmaceutical field yet. Uh, it's used in oil and gas. It's used in the airline industry. It's used to analyze and mitigate, prevent, low occurrence events that end up being catastrophic. So you can imagine in the airline industry what that is, uh, oil and gas as well, oil rig disasters. These are things that should never happen. And because they should never happen and, and don't happen very often, uh, they have very little data to deal with. And in the FDA regulated space, you might equate that to a recall, for example. These things should never happen. They do. But you want to gather enough data on these events that should never happen and in your case might ne not have happened yet and you certainly don't want ever to happen. You have to gather enough data to make some intelligent decisions about how to mitigate that risk. That's where the bow tie model comes in because it doesn't actually just look at the hazard, which is the undesired event, which may not yet have ever occurred. Um, it takes a look at everything around it. And that's where you get the bow tie concept. As you can see from the diagram, the hazard is at the center, but that's only um, basically the, the center point around which the information is gathered. The information is gathered starts from the threats. What can contribute to this undesired event, to this hazard? And there could be hundreds. In fact, in the airline industry, uh, they're typically only dealing with uh, a dozen undesired events, undesired events, and they're looking at thousands of potential threats that contribute to those, that can lead to these undesired events. So you could have hundreds, if not thousands, of threats. That's the first level of analysis. Once you know that, then you can start putting in place these preventive controls. These are ways, barriers, if you will, barriers that you're going to put in place to make sure that the threat doesn't become the undesired event. I have an example after this that I'll show you to explain this a little bit more in a little bit more detail. On the other side, if this undesired event actually does happen, you have a thing called recovery controls, which are also barriers. They're barriers to prevent the undesired event becoming a consequence. So when something bad happens, that's not the end of the game. You still have the opportunity to recover from that, and how well you recover will dictate what the end consequence will be. So the consequence is really what you're trying to avoid. All of the controls are in place to avoid getting to the consequence. And the bow type allows you to gather all that data in a structured way and then educate your organization on these controls and why they're important and how to make them effective. So it's a way of implementing risk mitigation without ever having, without ever experiencing the hazard um, or only experiencing it in a very limited, uh, limited way. The nice thing about the bow tie is you can still associate um, quantitative measures to it because that's an important part of risk assessment. And uh, you can associate a quantitative frequency with a threat, a quantitative likelihood with the preventive controls and recovery controls, and a quantitative severity with the consequence, which can give you a dashboard for bow tie scenarios. A typical organization might only have um, six or seven or eight bow tie scenarios, uh, which capture all of these, all of this data around specific undesired events. Uh, the example that I have is for uh, uh, an automobile, and um, obviously we, we all experience this. Um, there are many threats when you're driving a car, uh, bad weather, poor visibility, you're tired, uh, the road has no speed limits or people aren't uh, uh, complying with them. Uh, those are all examples of threats. Uh, the, um, the controls uh, preventive controls are things like uh, windshield wipers if it's raining, uh, headlights uh, for poor visibility, speed limits and, and uh, getting coffee or being rested. Uh, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship. You can have many controls for a single threat. You can have many threats be addressed by a single control. But these are all things that help prevent the undesired event. However, if an undesired event happens, you lose control of the car, that's your hazard, then there are things that 
are already in place to prevent the consequence from happening. You have seat belts, you have airbags, you have uh, guardrails, and these will lead the deployment of these recovery controls, the uh, ability to deploy them, the, the ability to have them, the availability of these controls, will lead to different consequences. You might only end up with a damaged vehicle uh, rather than something much worse. As I mentioned, this is heavily used in airlines. Um, the example that we have is um, an airline that um, actually has, they, they have every one of their 60,000 employees submitting safety reports. Now, obviously, these are reports, these are not reports on events that have happened. They don't have so many events that, that they would need to do that. These are on things that could have happened, near misses or information about the bow tie models that they put in place in order to, to analyze, to, be, to better understand the models, to better understand how to prevent the undesired event from happening. Then all this data is uh, analyzed by, uh, by experts, and they constantly reevaluate their, quanti uh, their, their uh, quantification of the, uh, of the bow tie data and um, make changes as a result of that, either changing the way that they deal with the barriers, they could be increasing barriers, adding barriers, they could be removing barriers that are not effective. All of these things happen on a constant basis. We've talked about the risk assessment tools. Now I'd like to talk about uh, something that captures the data that comes out of the risk assessment tool. As I mentioned, as I mentioned before, the risk management process doesn't stop when you have a, um, analyze your risk and come up with a, a number, a quantification for your risk, a risk level. The risk management uh, process also talks about making decisions, both short-term and long-term, and affecting change. Well, the risk register is a way of capturing the data that you'll need in order to understand what changes you'll need to make in the future. Um, when you do a risk assessment, you're evaluating a certain point in time, and that data is valid right now, at the time you make the risk assessment. The next day, it could be invalid because new data has come in, new events have happened, things have changed. The risk register captures the risk assessment data over time. As you're feeding risk assessment data into your compliance measurement processes, it's capturing that data and allows you to do things like um, perform time-based trend analysis on the risk levels in certain areas, so for certain product lines, for example, or for certain manufacturing sites or for certain areas of risk that you're specific or hazards that you're specifically interested in. You can capture that risk level over time to see how it's changing over time, which could provide very important information for the performance of your organization. You can also use the risk register, ro register to roll up risk. Now, you can't roll up risk all the way to a single number. That makes no sense because um, risk assessment performed in different functional areas will typically use different risk matrices, different risk models. They're calibrated differently based on the context. So you will typically not be able to roll up everything into a single risk level for the entire organization, but you certainly can roll up information that is similar or using the same, that use the same risk matrix so you can get a more overall picture of risk. And instead of having just risk data points, thousands of risk data points, um, you can roll it up into maybe six or seven major risk dashboards. That's the intent of the risk register, and we see it as so important to the compliance management process that it sits side by side with the CAPA process at the heart of the quality management system. Um, you're probably familiar at least with the concept of this slide where you have uh, data capture systems processes that uh, feed the CAPA process. And then out of the CAPA process comes all of the systems and processes that you have in place to manage the change that came out of the CAPA. Well, as part of that, the risk register is constantly monitoring the health, the risk level of the compliance management system and contributing to the decisions that guide the CAPAs, guide the changes, and really tell you if you're actually improving compliance or not. Uh, this is being used very effectively by uh, one of our customers they use the risk register and notify, this is on the portal when they log in, they, they notify their entire user base, all their employees, um, what are the top levels of risk, uh, sorry, the top hazards, the top, uh, the top hazards in terms of risk uh, in their organizational today. So as the risk register is capturing this data and prioritizing, 
user logs in and they get to see, okay, this is, these are the, the top risks that the organization is facing at this, t at this point in time. As I've shown, uh, risk technology can be applied from the very start of your production process all the way to the very end, so the post-market processes as well. It's, it's not just something that is uh, applicable to just one part of your process. And we believe risk management needs to start now. Um, it, should be an, it should be a part of your existing quality management system, not a separate process, but part of your existing compliance management processes. Um, I do want to emphasize, although I spent a lot of time speaking about the process, um, that it, it, risk technology is not automatic. It's, you can't just put these tools in place. You can't just put a process in place and have it just happen. It does depend in the end on uh, good decision making by people. Um, so in order for it to be effective, it's more than just deploying technology tools. I'm not just talking software. I'm talking about the tools themselves and the processes. It's also about training um, the people who will use it, about building the awareness in the organization, and it eventually um, making the necessary cultural change to make risk part of the day-to-day -day conversation. Once you've done that, though, uh, risk offers a common language for compliance, whereas now we're stuck with different functional definitions of compliance and dif dif different functional descriptions of non-compliance that people have difficulty communicating to other functions or to senior management. With risk, you can actually cut across the, the uh, terminology that's used in the different operational areas and present your compliance management story in a common language in a way that people understand. And, and also associate colors with it, which is always nice, um, and get the message across very quickly. And that's the end of today's presentation. I'd hand it over to Patty, who I think will moderate the questions. Yes, thank you so much, Morgan, for that comprehensive presentation. And we have gotten a few questions in uh, through the live event, and we also had some come in through the registration process. And uh, I just want to mention to our attendees, please continue to send in your questions, and we will get to as many as possible. Uh, we have someone saying that detectability is not part of the risk equation, uh, severity and occurrence. How is this used? Dete yeah, detectability is used in the FMEA process as a way of further separating the potential failures in a product. So to illustrate this point, if I, have, if I break down my product into 100 components, and uh, as an example, and I have to prioritize the risk associated with the failures on each of these components, if I only have two dimensions to use, which is probability and severity, I can only achieve a certain level of range of risk levels. If I add a third dimension, and if my calculation for risk is uh, the, the product of the dimensions, so probability times severity times detectability, I can increase the range of different risk levels. And that makes it easier for me to prioritize the effort that I, that I need to apply to mitigate that risk. Detectability is, is being proven as just another way of adding to the risk picture um, in the FMEA model. Okay, and we have a, another question. Can the tool preempt or highlight potential risk based on applicable business controls? I'm just uh, trying to <laughs> trying to understand that one. Um, the Yes. So in, in the short answer is yes, because the, the idea of the tool is that it will provide you with a risk level, and that will therefore highlight the risk, um, and it will give you some guidance. It won't tell you what the controls, the business controls you need to put in place are. That's going to end up being an expert decision. What it will do is flag an area where you do need to apply additional business controls, and at that point, you can step in and decide what business controls need to need to be put in place. So I won't tell you what business controls to put in place, but it'll tell you where you do need additional control. And what types of risks should be considered in quality management? There are many, and that's a very good question, actually. One of the questions we get from our customers um, all the time is, okay, you, you're providing us with tools, and you're telling us that we need to do this risk assessment evaluation. Um, where do I get my starting point? Where do I get my library of hazards, my library of risks uh, for my industry or even for my segment of my industry? 
And, um, and we don't have an answer to that. Some industries have done a pretty good job of this. Um, oil and gas is, is an example. Um, the air, airlines is an example. Um, we don't see that in a medical device uh, yet, where there's a, an acceptable or accepted, if you will, starting list of hazards uh, for um, producing medical device um, medical devices. So that's certainly an industry initiative that probably needs to get started. Um, the best place to start is going to be just do a brainstorming session. And, and um, for organizations that are new to the risk management process or risk assessment models, uh, that is usually where they will start. They'll go and do get their experts in a room, and they'll brainstorm the uh, potential hazards that they need to be worried about. And then you'll only be, know if those hazards are correct or not, if those hazards are relevant or not, or if they're detailed enough or maybe too detailed, only once you've implemented the process and started evaluating the risk levels of those hazards. That's when it'll start making sense. Before that, it's really just a guess. But the best guess is going to be from your own internal team um, at the beginning of the process. And we have a follow-up to the other question, can the tool preempt or highlight potential risk based on applicable business controls? And the follow-up is, based on real-time feedback in the system linked to other business systems, would it update those risk assessment outputs? Y yes. So that's actually, that's I, I understand better, I guess, now. Um, uh, several of our customers have taken the approach that the user and, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to answer this correctly this time, and if not, please follow up again. But um, several customers have said, well, I have this risk assessment matrix. It asks me to put in probability and severity. Um, severity is something that I need an expert to decide because that's based on the, on the, the, the context. Pro probability is something that is known because I have that data in either the ETQ system or in a related system. I know how many shipments I had. I know how many hours of flight uh, flight, flight time um, th there were, uh, or how many hours worked for uh, an employee. I, I have the probability data. So what they've done is they've actually automated, automated using statistical techniques, and they vary, um, coming up with the probability uh, dimension. So the user goes in, and all they really need to do is decide how severe is this. Often that's known. That's very clear. It's, it's obvious from the description of the hazard. Um, and the probability is automatically provided, and therefore their risk level can be almost automatically derived. It's not completely. You still need to check it. still needs to be vetted, but um, that pretty much drives the risk level uh, to, to an almost, almost automatic, um, into, into an almost automatic process. All right, and we have another question. Many of your examples were ones where physical observations are possible. What tools are helpful to software companies where the product nor its manufacturing process are visible? Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I can't think of one right now. Um, the, I, I guess the tools that you would be looking at then, because you can't do physical inspection um, which is uh, or auditing, um, the tools that would be in, in, in important are the ones that happen in the design phase. So FMEA would be a, a very good um, a good example of that, where you make all of your risk decisions, if you will, before you manufacture, before you uh, put into production, and you're going, you're basically evaluating the risk of potential failures based on the design. Uh, that's always applicable because the design will always be visible. All right, and another of our attendees is saying we follow ISO 14971 for risk management. How does that relate to ISO 31000? It's yeah, it's a, it's a um, it's an app, it's an industry level application. So 31 um, the, the 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 risk level the risk standards are very similar. In fact, the wording is the same. Is sorry, the wording is very similar. Um, if you're following um, the industry specific version. You don't need to follow 31,000 uh, because it has everything that you need in there. The 31,000 is more of a generic version of that. Um, I believe it was it was there first, and then they they created industry specific versions of that standard um, later on. So um, stay with the one you have that's specific to your industry, and the 31,000 is for people who who not complying with a, a risk management standard right now. And how do you factor in human factors to risk management? We we have dealt with that in the airline industry. Um, it's a way of um, 
of making better decisions on the severity of the, um, of the uh, I guess, of the impact, the severity of the event. Um, it doesn't, it's not part of the risk assessment tool because it's, it's actually, they don't consider it part of the standard risk assessment um, methodology. It's a contributing factor, if you will, a contributing information. And right now, human factors is very, um, is still, still very leading edge. Uh, even in the airline industry where we have, um, where risk assessment is used by everyone, human factors is only still used in a very small minority. Uh, so I don't, we don't consider that to be part of the risk assessment tools um, in the compliance management space yet. It could be, but uh, not right now. Okay. And we have somebody, uh, uh, I guess they're mentioning that the example that you use for FEMA is a living document, regularly updated. Could the tool provide some of this update? Yes. Uh, well, the, I mean, the tool, provides, the tool provides a living FEMA document. Uh, so in other words, it's version controlled. And uh, you would you would be expected to um, update it on a regular basis. In fact, one of the presentation we give, which is a different presentation, we talk about the cycle uh, that takes you from the FEMA identifying the potential hazards uh, to your hazard analysis, which is how do those potential hazards or potential failures affect the product, the safety product safety. That's the hazard analysis process um, in the FDA world. I'm talking about. And that feeds into your complaints management process because you want to um, make sure that your organization is, is uh, set up to uh, address these potential hazards that you haven't mitigated to, uh, to, an, you know, to um, a zero level of risk. So these are things that could happen. And that feeds into your capital process, which the capital process should feed right back into your FMEA as part of the changes that you need to make. Uh, which will start with doing an impact anal assessment using an FMEA. So yes, um, we, um, we we see it as a cycle of um, which involves the FMEA going all the way through the process until it ends up back at the FMEA. Okay, and uh, uh, actually we've gone a little long, but we do have one more question uh, that I'd like to ask. Uh, is there a good guidance document to apply the ISO risk management? The 31,000 is a good guidance. It's, it's a little bit um, vague. Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult read. And so um, the best guidance would probably be some uh, a book, and I don't have any recommendations, that interprets that standard and provides um, best practices for implementing risk management. Uh, other than that, uh, go to the industry-specific version of the risk management uh, standard or to the um, the, com the standard that you're trying to comply with now, and just look at look for the the, ri the term risk um, and hazard in your standard, and look at the wording around that, uh, because they are now in pretty much every standard, and that'll tell you the things you need to be focused on. The 31,000 standard is a great uh, top-level guidance. It is very difficult to read, and um, my recommendation would be go get a book that. Um, that summarizes it in, in a way that's um, understandable. Well, thank you so much, uh, Morgan, and also thank you to all of our attendees for sending in their questions. If you want uh, any additional information, uh, feel free to reach out to ETQ at info at etq.com and visit their website, etq.com. And also, uh, they have a very informative blog, blog.etq.com. And Morgan can be reached at mpalmer at etq.com. And uh, we will uh, send out a link in a, we'll send out an email in a couple of days with a link to the archive recording of this event along with a copy of the slides. That concludes our event. Thank you everybody and have a great day.